Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming this afternoon to what we call an ICT conversation. My name is Vidyard Kisun, and I'm one of the people who has been involved in an informal gathering which has been taking place since um, September last year. What the idea was with the ICT conversation is to mobilize people who are interested in information and communications technology in Guyana, and that could be anyone, and Brain Street uh, and the CEO Lance Sainz here has donated its space to have a gaff every month, roughly, it should have been every month, but sometimes we skip months, to talk about things related to information and communications technology. The last event was extremely oversubscribed and the room was too large. So we thought, because of the interest generated there, to move to the conference room. However, Guyana is this interesting place where people are sometimes predictable and sometimes not so unpredictable. And maybe the topic and the speaker this week aren't as interesting as um, we expected. But that being said, thanks very much to everyone for being here. And what we, talk, what we thought we'd talk about this afternoon is that Lance, who's the CEO of Brain Street, he's also an advisor to the Ministry of Public Tele Telecommunications. And he was involved in the development of the telecoms liberalization legislation. And that is critical legislation for Guyana in terms of the ICT sector. Cynics would know that you can pass wonderful laws and nothing could happen for 10, 15, 20 years. And we have a lot of examples of that in Guyana. So we thought that it was important to share information because we know the bill is sometimes heavy to read and um, legislation is often very difficult to read. And that Lance would guide from the perspective, not only as an advisor, but certainly from the perspective of citizenship and from civil society, to talk about a little bit about um, how the legislation, what has to happen next. At the same time, too, of course, there are other kinds of legislation which have to come into place to enable an ICT-based industry. And the idea was this afternoon to talk through um, some of those things and how the advocacy will move forward to get that legislation not only passed but operationalized and implemented. So first I'll ask Lance to do the presentation and then afterwards we'll have the discussion. Thanks. Thanks Lance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Afternoon all. Once again the unpredictability of these things uh, but nevertheless, useless, useful conversations because um, really what happens is that ICT is not going to move forward the way we like, the way we would like, unless there is something that we call an, an enabling environment. And that happens in a couple of areas. It is policy as a whole, and then there is legislation, which is a key part of the policy that you want to implement. So if you don't build that kind of enabling environment, certainly at a certain level, it's going to be difficult to move forward in the way that uh, we would like to. If we want to, if some of us want to become businesses and we want to do, provide services online, if we want to do cross-border service, all these kinds of things in many instances require, require regulation. Now the first step in that direction, as you would know, was the liberalization of the current uh, telecommunication environment. Many of you would know that the government of Guyana in 1990 signed a 25-year-old uh, exclusive agreement with a company called Atlantic Telenetwork, and that was, that was how gt and was created. Now, the first exclusive license was for 20 years with an option of automatic renewal for an additional 15 years in 2010. So 2010 came, 2010 was left. The government did not intervene in the process, so therefore there was an automatic extension of the license for 15 years. So the situation that you find yourself in now is that the work that was done on the liberalization from about 2012, 2013, 
in Parliament through the um, Special Select Committee, where there were a series of consultations and discussions, inputs from a lot of us in terms of what this new bill should look like. Now, that bill, as you know, a couple of weeks ago, came to Parliament and was passed. So what we now have is the first stage of, of the movement or the framework uh, towards te te telecommunication uh, liberalization. Now, this is where the hard work starts. Some people seem to get the impression that once the bill is passed, we've got full liberalization and all kinds of companies are going to come in and provide all kinds of services and so on. That is the intent, but it can happen now because there's work to be done. One of the critical things that we have to do is engage in discussions with gt and Now, as I said to you, they are now in the extended stage of their exclusive license, which is for 15 years. We are now asking gt and to give up nine years of that license. So if you're doing that, this is a business at the end of the day. So what happens is that you've got to have a discussion with them in terms of how we're going to liberalize in view of the fact that they have nine years left on their license. So this means a discussion about the value of those nine years. It means a discussion of the sorts of things that they would like to see in a new license as a benefit themselves. And then at, on the government side, on the public side, we would then have to see the provisions that will benefit us. What is, what is clear, however, is that everybody is starting in, in a liberalized environment with a brand new license. The question is that we have to get over this, the issue now, is that we have to get over this hump in terms of having, getting gt and and the government agree as well, on an amicable resolution of the current license in place, which is the, which is the monopoly that that's in effect. So there's a series of things that have to go on. For example, um, if gt and has any liabilities as far as the government is, of concern, is concerned, that has to be discussed. If we're going to have a potential value of the remaining nine years, that is not a discussion that is really going to happen because it's difficult to put a value on a, um, on a school license for, for nine years down the road because you're doing future projections and earnings and stuff like that. And that gets into a science that will only get us into dispute. What will happen now is the meeting of minds to see how we're going to settle this. So what gt and is looking for, what, what the telecom regulator, in this case the government, is looking for, and then we come to a solution. By now, gt and like everybody else, has realized that the days of the monopoly have, you know, has passed. So certainly the language that you have heard and, the, and, the, and the, certainly the utterings that you might have seen on television, in the case of gt and as well, is, it uh, looks forward to a liberalized environment, but they want their current contract treated fairly, which the government of Guyana, of course, is committed to do. So now we have to have that hard discussion, which we are hoping will start, uh, I don't think it's going to start in August, more than likely those, that conversation will start in September. Um, if all goes well, we are hoping that that discussion concludes, hopefully, um, in, um, by the end of October once they know peculiarities or once they, you know, once they know difficulties that arise. So that is one um, action that needs, to be, that needs to be started and completed. The other piece of work that needs to be done is the completion of the regulations that will govern, that will govern the sector. The act itself has passed. What we need to do is put in the regulation that does that. Now that that um, is going to be in eight sections. Um, the first one is the license and frequency of authorization. That really deals with um, how you apply for the license and the rules and regulations that govern that. There is interconnection and access, which are the rules that govern how the telephone companies are going to speak to each other and how consumer access is facilitated um, between the, all the telecom carriers that might, might be in the marketplace. There is pricing, of course, um, that has to do with competition and that has to do with um, competitive pricing for the services that are being provided. There is universal access and universal services. This has to do with, even though you have a competitive environment, there are going to be areas that, that, are, that we call underserved areas. What happens is that, what it means is that those are areas that really, if you're a commercial entity, it doesn't make sense for you to go. You don't have enough numbers, you don't have enough, you know, 
you ain't got enough mass to make a dollar. But certainly you make provisions for that. These are on the serve areas. So it is either done through funding via the universal service fund, or there's universal access policy that gives you a special dispensation for going into those areas that don't have any money. Because at the end of the day, the state, the state wants connectivity as, to be as wide as it possibly can. The issue, though, is that you have commercial providers, so you're going to have to come to arrangements to see whether they go or somebody else goes to provide the service. So, for example, one of you could decide that you want to provide a last mile service. So gt and could, could, you know, could, could give you back all support uh, you know, to a particular point, and then from there you could go. If you believe you could make money in this underserved area, well, then you can have a go at making, uh, making a dollar as well. And it may be possible that the Universal Service Fund may give you some support in that regard. Um, of course, you have the competition regulations. Um, the, the primary thrust of this new legislation, the new regulations, is to make sure that there's a level playing field in a purely competitive environment. And of course, that has to be governed. So any time there is maneuvering to become the, the most dominant player or, you know, or, you know, or to become the one that's, that's the largest in terms of the provision of services, that those are the things that have to be governed as well, just in case there are issues of what, of what we like to call unfair competition. There is, of course, consumer protection regulations as well. Um, and then we have the big one, which is spectrum management regulations. We already have something called the National Frequency Management Unit. And what, what is going to happen is that that agency is going to be subsumed into something that's, that's going to be called the new telecommunications agency. And spectrum management is, is a primary function of what MFMU does. So what MFMU does is that they assign the bandwidth to the various carriers. So you, they're the ones that govern it and make sure it's managed properly, make sure everybody gets what they're doing, make sure there's no trespassing on, on people's frequencies, make sure that, make sure that the whole issue of, of the distribution and use of bandwidth is done in a managed and orderly fashion. So there are regulations that govern that. Uh, so that is something as well that has to be looked at. There's going to have to be a new spectrum plan uh, and going forward in terms of saying, well, what are the, what system we're going to use? Whether we're going to use a North, North American system or whether we're going to use the Asia Pacific system, all of these discussions that we're going to have as part of the planning moving forward as far as what the telecommunications sector is going to look like. So that's the regulation that needs to be done. What is also critical is the creation of the telecommunications authority. So, because what happens is that by the time we go live, and by the time the minister decides that this legislation is going to be in effect, the telecom, the new telecommunication authority must be in effect. Must be there. Because they're the ones that have to process the licenses, they're the ones that have to process the new applications, and they are the ones who have to go and do the analysis to make sure that whatever telecommunication providers are applying to for services, they meet the criteria as per the new legislation and as per the new regulations. So it must be ready. It has to be. And if you guys, you know, and pretty soon I suspect they're going to be, you're going to see adverts for positions, communication engineers, policy people and stuff like that. So any of you that, that have an interest in that and I believe you have the skills for that, please please apply because that particular agency is going to need a level of skill, especially in, especially in this kind of environment and especially in this new competitive telecom environment. We're going to need some specialists in there to be able to manage it properly. What I suspect is going to happen is that even though you join, one of the things that, that, that we will probably do is look to get some assistance from the FCC or someone like that, or even our Caribbean sisters and brothers, to provide some training to so all of those new employees in terms of understanding how to manage a liberalized telecommunication environment. So that is going to be part of the process as well. But it is, it is critical that, um, that, that that agency is created at the time the liberalization is done. Um, what I forgot to say a few minutes ago, there are three phases of this. One phase is completed, it passes parliament. What also has to happen is the president has to assent, but it doesn't go into effect until there's a ministerial order. And that's what I was referring to a few minutes ago, that when it is the ministerial order that will bring it into effect, but everything has to be done by then. Regulations have to be done, the authority has to be created, everything fully staffed, fully prepared to go, uh, day one, 
day one after the, the law comes into effect. In terms of a timeline, I, I think for the amount of work that needs to be done, I, I, I think uh, we should be able to get it done later on this year. Um, I suspect around November, uh, November, the end of November is a, is, is a realistic assessment in terms of how long it will take. It's a, it's a lot of work to create the, the regulations, and we're only putting it in there why, why we believe that the discussions with GT&T should not be extremely difficult. We just want to give us the coverage that, that is to make sure that all that gets done before we go into, before we go into effect. Um, in terms of, so what does that mean? It means that you can have new players in the market. It means that um, there is scope for all manners of things ICT in terms of being able to expand as a business, provide the kind of services at affordable prices. Now, when are we going to get affordable prices? Um, gt and is the incumbent, as we all know, and there's a level of infrastructure in there already. Any other provider coming in will have to play catch up. So Digicel will have to bring their fiber in, and anybody else who wants to bring their fiber in will, you know, can, uh, can certainly do so under the new legislation. Now, it takes nine months a year, on average, to, um, to bring in fiber based on past experience. So that's if you're bringing it on the C5, but nine months a year. We suspect that gt and may have started, uh, uh, Digicel may have started already, but I, I think we're gonna see a year before we really start to get the kind of a fiber capacity that is going to be um, in the market for us to truly benefit uh, from the prices. What you're probably going to see as well is a diversification of, of services uh, in terms of what uh, telcos are going to offer. So look out for, look out for gt and for example, to, to be potentially providing uh, cable services, for example, the same way e-networks do, because you own infrastructure. So because you're a telecom provider, then the world, you know, the, the world is your oyster in terms of the kind of services that uh, you, can, you can provide with the, um, with the fiber. We're going to have some issues, I believe. Um, there are certain pieces in the legislation that the telcos are not particularly crazy about. Um, one of those, for example, is infrastructure sharing, and another one is, is net neutrality. Now, infrastructure sharing just deals in particular with with, with how you're going to organize yourself. So for example, the way it is now, if you look on the post in Georgetown, you got about three, four cable, you know, you know, um, you know uh, fiber lines running on the post. And what happens with local jurisdictions, like, like what's happening in Barbados? The city of Bridgetown is saying, but here now, we, we can't continue to have every man jack laying fiber all over the town. So what has to happen now is that we have to, be, we have to begin to, to have agreements in terms of in terms of how we're going to handle this. So what may happen, uh, as in Barbados, is a scenario where Barbados is telling the telcos, look, y'all ain't gonna share this fiber. So even though, even though cable and wireless is bringing the fiber to the house, Digicel should have the right to you know, you know, take, part of that, take part of that fiber and provide services of their own. Now, obviously, nobody is taking that well. And certainly gt and is not going to take that well. I don't expect them to, to take that well as well. So how we manage those types of things um, as, as we move forward is going to be tricky in terms of who is going to own the infrastructure, who is going to rent from who, who is going to sell from who. So all those conversations are, are going to come up because we simply can't have a situation where every man jack running fiber, you know, um, all over the town. Which is happening now. If you go look at the post anywhere in town now, uh, E-Networks is on there, Atlantic Cable is on there, gt and is on, Digital is running cable, you know, running cable. So, you know, after time, that, that simply becomes unmanageable. So a lot, of, a lot of municipal planning will then, you know, come into effect when we start to talk about infrastructure sharing. The troublesome one is net neutrality. Um, and in essence, what happens there is a, is, is a concept where you commit where you commit to providing data without any discrimination, without fear or favor, um, equally to all. And what happens with it? And the telcos have been complaining about that because of things like WhatsApp, Fiber, Facebook, mess Facebook Messenger, uh, FaceTime, what have you. Because a lot of this information comes across free and they can't charge. And one of the things that they do not like is the fact that it's, it's dominating this space. 
added to the fact that they are losing voice data revenue because of those things and they're not making the money back for it. So what you have is a bit of a tumble where they're proposing other ways of doing it. So for example, they suggest to you that they would like to have tiered services. So if you are a person who needs, you know, if you're a high flyer and you need to use Netflix, uh, you know, uh, you know, 24 hours a day, but then you pay a certain rate for that. If you're an ordinary user just doing general browsing and stuff, then you pay for that as well. That, that is completely opposite to what net neutrality is. And this is a tough discussion all over the Caribbean. Guyana is probably the first CARICOM territory to pass the, 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 the level of net neutrality legislation that there currently is in terms of ensuring that um, there is no discrimination in terms of the provision of data uh, via telecommunications providers. That they are not, nobody is happy. The other, the, in, in the other territories, there is a consistent discussion about that. Now there are discussion papers and documents out. Um, everybody is commenting. Canto is commenting. You know, the cable and wireless is, is, is commenting on this trying to urge that this doesn't happen. But there's another side to this. Um, every time you hear the argument from the telecom providers, even the regulators, it's about the fact that we have a concern about Google's data, we have a concern about Facebook's data, we have a concern about Netflix, whatever it is that you have. One of the concerns that I certainly believe that must that must be taken into account is what happens here, what happens in the Caribbean. Because what happens when you find a young Netflix running around the place in Guyana and Barbados? He must be able to be comfortable that, that, that if he's going to produce a product and if he's going to distribute content, he must be able to do it in the freest environment that it is. Because he can't take on the cost of dealing with, with uh, you know, con conditional bandwidth and content. He can't afford it. He's trying to make a living. This is a startup company. So one of the things that some of us have been telling regulators is that as you make your pushback argument against the telco regulators, it's not only about Google, and it's not only about WhatsApp, it's not only about that. It's about the development of the ICT environment that, um, that needs to happen. And for that to happen, we need to ensure that there's net neutrality in our, um, in our telecommunication networks. There may be some pushing and shoving, so uh, for example, someone may say that, look, we don't have the technology to handle this right now. Give us a year or two to upgrade our networks and stuff like that. But you gotta make a, but the, the telecommunication companies will have to make a strong case for, um, uh, for that. Now, I bring all this up because a lot of this, or most of this has to go out for consultation um, at the end of the day. And what happens to us in this industry is that we don't pay attention. We never have except for a few of us who fast and nosy all the time. But by and large, we don't pay this sort of attention that we need to pay as practitioners, as interested parties, or whatever, to make sure that the legislation that they put in there, and we have to do the research. Ask your colleagues in and out of Guyana to make sure that the regulations that, that, are, being, that, are, being, um, that are being developed will benefit you um, in the various ways that it should. So, when this is out, is I am, will invite, and certainly from my side, I will make sure that um, information is put out there for you to see, for you to discuss, for you to debate, to make sure this is the right legislation that's being done, and do, and do your supporting research, and there's nothing wrong with sub making submissions at, at that time, to be able to decide if, if these things are right, if these things are, are, are right for you or not. All right? So, a lot of it. So, in other words, in, in the shortest possible language is to pay attention. Uh, pay attention to legislation, pay attention to, to regulations, pay attention to all those things to make sure that what you're getting in there at a certain level benefits you, either as an individual or as, an, or, 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 I don't know, or as a business. Um, so, that is, is as, as, as it, um, it pertains to the telecommunications bill. So, so stay tuned. There are some other bills that we need to look at, and um, hopefully in early in the new year that, that will all be taken into consideration. And one of those is the long or standard, long awaiting e-transactions bill, or what some of you like to call the e-commerce bill, which is critical for anyone that wants to conduct business at a, at a very serious level on the internet. You have to have the supporting legislation on the ground. If anybody is going to deal with you, if you get into arrangements with external agencies and stuff like that, they have to be comfortable that they're allowed to protect them and you in terms of being able to conduct business. 
There was a first draft done, I think, uh, based on what I see from the, from the drafts I look at. There was one in 2003, and it looks like that was further updated in 2010. Um, so we're looking at two. Uh, they would, so some legal people will, will, will take a look at that and see whether, see, the, this is what we're looking for in terms, in terms of the bill. There are some provisions for things like data protection and, um, and, and similar types of things in, in, in that act. So we have to see the extent of that act in terms of what it's doing. There's also some con consumer things in there as well. What happens to us, unfortunately, is that when we do bills, sometimes we do it in isolation, not realizing that other bills are being written. So what happens is that when you look at this bill, this bill has a lot of stuff in there. And in view of the telecoms bill that's out, you have to look and see the, the, the provisions of that versus what we currently have. So there may be some changes, and there may be some editing that needs to be done. Um, another bill that's critical is data protection. Primarily because of the fact that we are now at the stage in Guyana where every agency known to man, including the commercial banks and others, are collecting a tremendous amount of information about us as citizens. And there's no real governance in terms of how that information is being protected, is being governed. In the, in the Financial Institutions Act, I believe it is passed, right, where, they, where they're making a simple request to get bank information, bank data, and so on. Um, and I suspect when the Sarun and Sopo acts come, they may ask for a similar um, a similar condition, right? What happens in some other countries with data protection acts is that they may be like there may be about eight pillars that govern the, the um, govern the need for information to be released, and any other act, it you know simply references that act for guidance in terms of that. So before we have too many bills or too much legislation going individually and getting information, one of the things that we think makes the most sense is to have a complete bill that will simply govern how information is being protected. Within government agencies, what happens sometimes in order to get things done, some agencies come together with others and sign protocols and say, well, look, you give me this information, I give you that information, and so on and so forth. While that may be useful from a, or, or practical from, you know, uh, from, uh, from, 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 a, from a realistic perspective, at the end of the day, these things need to be governed, right? So those are two other bills that certainly um, warrant consideration um, in terms of that. And then after that, it's really, there are some other bills, of course. There are always bills that need to be addressed and need to be fixed and so on and so forth. But really, it's the policy that, um, that needs to be addressed in terms of how between the government, the private sector, civil society, how do you go about building an enabling environment for ICT to grow, to, um, to grow, thrive, and, 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 and prosper? I think we know what the reality is. Um, the, the other productive sectors in 2016 are not working as they used to in the past. That is the reality that we have. They're not going to contribute to the, um, the gross national product as they used to. So the question now is diversification, go find other things. And ICT is a, is, is a possible productive sector that could contribute significantly, that, that, that could create the kinds of jobs that we'd like to see, whether they're export type jobs or whether they're domestic jobs or what have you. But that's not gonna happen unless we have proper planning in terms of how we're gonna position ICT, what we need to do. The human capital development that needs to be done, the, um, the investment in schools, the investment in training, the investment in, in all of that, the, 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 the building of an ICT private sector. The effective use of ICT is as, 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 a, as a proper cross-cutting component of, um, of the entire government sector in order to improve the efficiency, the, the efficiency in how they deliver services to the citizens. And all of that requires some thinking and some planning. And despite the challenges that, that, that we might have, we could all sit down and say, well, yeah, you know, GPS is giving blackout, and the power is still unstable, and this, that, the other. But we got to press on, right? Um, that's been, for as long as I've been back in Guyana, that's since 1994. Blackouts have been an issue. Either short or long, that's been a problem, and we've managed to still survive. So we have to understand now that that it is that, that uh, we need to go forward. And I come back to the same discussion again, that you got to get involved in, 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 in this matter. Can me for me and Vidya and four or five others. Every time we sit down and develop plans in this country in the past, it's me, Vidya, and about four or six others get in a room and write a set of things and then hand it to the government to review. 
And none of you in, uh, in all those years could honestly say, yeah, we asked some of you what you think, and, and you know, you know, be, you know, you be doing this and so on. But in essence, it's five or six of me in a room, you know, writing documents and handing it to the government at the end of the day. So what has to happen now is that there has to be a wider form of consultation. And, but if we can do the consultation, well, then you guys got to participate um, at the end of the day. And it, in, and it is in your interest to do so. Right? This is your industry, and at the end of the day, you've got to decide. Well, your industry, your business, and your format, and stuff like that. And you've got to decide to do that. So you've got to start to think about what you want to see in a policy level. What kind of industry you want to see? What kind of business you want to see done? Should we worry about things like call centers and stuff like that? Or, or we don't want to do that anymore when we want to go up the food chain and do business process outsourcing, do programming, animation, whatever it is, what other services that, 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 that we want to do. Is that realistic in the short term? Maybe we got to live with the call center business in the, in the, in the early days as we, as we train, build and grow and become more developers and so on and so forth. Um, to be able to provide other services and stuff. We always hear this talk about our strategic position on the South American continent and the fact that we're the only ones speaking English and, and so on and so forth. And, and, and the low labor cost gives us, mar gives us that wonderful potential to do marvelous things. Um, that has been going on since independence. So the, 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 the question now is, is, is fine. So we, we have all these things and stuff, and there's an opportunity to, um, and I think to some extent, um, probably for the first time, I, th I think now what is a, what so far is a, is, a, is a good sign is that you, there is a ministry that has been created um, in, in this instance, and you, I, I think that the, 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 your function now is to take, take advantage of that and begin to interfere in the process in terms of making decisions. I think there'll be some listening. Um, a group, came, a group came about a week and a half ago agitating for, um, for e-commerce legislation because they were a group that decided that they wanted to participate in, in, uh, in online business and found that they, there, was no, there was no local uh, merchants for, for handling things like payments and stuff like that. PayPal, even though, there's a, even though there's a Guyanese version, has limitations in terms of the kind of things that you could do. So even though you could do the payment, you, I think it, it, there's a difficulty with merchant services and, and things and stuff like that. So because they ran into these barriers, they then came and said, well, look, we need to be able to see how we could build an environment that will support, that will support e-commerce or e-transactions. There are some other agencies like IPEN and some others who would like to do some other things as well in terms of handling payments. They would like to see the legislation put in place as well. So there are a series of things that people would like to see, but it's, it's coming together to begin to agitate for those things. And um, so we can move the process forward. I think I have spoken enough. Um, so far. So um, I'll hand the floor back over to the chair, and so hopefully we will get into a discussion about where we think we should be heading next. Thank you, sir. Which I think also has some kind of 
ETF that came out, right? So, um, and you, you mentioned the issue of sorrow and uh, so forth. We've seen already about leaks, with the concerns about leaks of private information, which was supposedly gathered in um, the pursuit of investigations um, that, that have been leaked to the media, and there is no law preventing right now the media from publishing any of that leaked information. And, and that is, um, you know, that, that, that is of concern, um, I'm sure, for, you know, for our investigation. So, uh, all right, any um, questions or comments or thoughts? Or is it always a thing? Should we leave it to we will do what we want? <laughs> Keep a wide list. But certainly in terms of consumer regulations and, and, in, and in terms of the regulations as far as what consumers expect in terms of data quality. And so we got to get to a point that says that if you say you're getting X amount of speed or X amount of delivery or if you got a plan that is supposed to get, you know, if, if you have a plan that says that you get 600 meg of data or whatever it is, well, then you have to make sure that you get that. Um, there's a... There's a limit to how much, I should say to you that sometimes there's a limit to how much you can do because you always get into an argument of what constitutes, um, what constitutes data quality, what constitutes speed. For example, what happens, uh, let me take now for example. If you, if you say you're paying for a 10 megabit service on gt &T, that 10 megabit service is guaranteed from your house to the termination point of gt &T. You don't get that 10 mega speed going into the internet, right? Now, you may make an argument and say, well, why aren't you getting that kind of speed at the end of the day? gt &T may say to you, well, you're not buying dedicated service. You're buying something with a collision ratio of 10 to 1 or a collision ratio of 15 to 1. Now, that's not necessarily clear when you buy the service, all right? That discussion doesn't come up. But you get into a dispute in terms of whether that is poor quality of service or not. So one of the things that has to happen in those instances is that we gotta make sure in the regulations that we are clear in terms of what quality of service means or how it is defined, and that will be defined in the regulations. So the answer to you in general is yes, but I suspect that as we go on complaining about a lack of service, you can get some pushback in terms of what exactly it means. But the intent is in the regulations to make sure that you get the best quality of service that there is. Let me talk a bit about that for a second. One of the things that was decided um, just before the Jubilee celebrations was that we couldn't have a situation where people came in on the existing platform and complained about the speed that they had. And what we did initially at that time was to, was to provide some spectrum as a first step towards liberalization. We decided to offer some spectrum uh, on the 850 megahertz band, which which will provide, which would have allowed them to provide 4G 4G services at the end of the day. Um, it is how they manage that service that will determine. Well, of course, they're marketing, so they're putting as many people as possible under the 4G network at the end of the day. What happens is the amount of service that they could provide in most instances is also a function of the amount of bandwidth that they've got. And what they got in essence was, was some startup bandwidth to begin to offer the 4G service. 
the full range of 4G service and all that will happen when there is, um, when there is full liberalization. And gt t will tell you that, that based on the bandwidth that they have, they are unable to provide a lot of service. But that service primarily at the time was to facilitate the Jubilee celebration. Yes, they, because the, the regulator at this point in order to facilitate 4G already gave the maximum amount of bandwidth. The fiber is a separate matter. Oh, okay. a separate matter. When, uh, when, the new, when the new, uh, when the new act and when the, when the regulations and when the environment comes into effect, every telco has to come and apply for how much spectrum that they want. All right? And that is when they're going to have to put out an, ex, you know, an explanation of how they're going to use the bandwidth and in the, in the various uh, frequency bands that they're going to use the bandwidth in order to give the best possible service. So the law provides for complaints about the support to the PUC. PUC. And the PUC. The, right, right now to the PUC. But we will take over that role in the, um, uh, in, in the consumer protection regulation. I start by being to say what well, kind of body has complained with PUC. Because well, PUC, I think, is underutilized with a lot of these issues. I think it has been, it has, I think there was this issue with the, uh, the, the, the body sway, I think, you know, present and all of that. I don't remember if it was still in the PUC. That's it. So, I, I know you was, I think, if I, if I was to think for a so I would kind of like to complain. But, uh, I, I don't know if anybody, I, I think it's maybe constitution complaining to PUC. So, you know, if I tell the past, run some of this and, 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 and to get the discussions, then they will call the authority, then they will call the company to explain uh, where they are. Right. Uh, I just want to get clarification on something that this uh, this gentleman mentioned. Um, you're saying that GTT is limited by uh, the, the current and uh, the spectrum regulator currently? That your yes. services? Okay, I see. Everybody gets a certain amount. Every, I mean, it, it, it's not that. 